Hello, welcome back to the Beautiful Easel tutorial series. Today we're doing another preset deep dive and it's not cinematic hit generator, it's the preset next to it. I have to start somewhere else because the moment I select the preset we're going to start hearing some, some noise. Let's see what we've got. I have not touched a thing. Now I'm pressing keys on the keyboard. Okay, there's a lot to go at in this one. Let's get on with it. Now normally what I do with presets is strip everything away back to the oscillator and then build from the ground up. We actually can't do that very easily with this preset. There are so many interconnected modules working together that it's actually not practical to start from the bottom and work up. We have to start at the end and strip stuff away. The first thing that I'm going to pull away are the effects. The sumptuous analog delay, but we don't need it. And we've got quite a nice sounding phaser. We don't need that either. So both of those effects are having an effect the, the sound is so crazy, there's so much going on, that it's really difficult to hear any individual thing. But an effect unit is an effect unit. You've heard a phase, you've heard a delay. We're just taking those away for the sake of simplicity. There's nothing going on in the right-hand module at all. It's on, but non-functional, so we can throw that away. And the left hand is applying, this is at 50%, the gate, the complex oscillators tamba. Uh, it's being modulated in this sawtooth kind of shape. So basically, again, this is pretty straightforward. If I bring the sound back up, turn the left hand module off, you just hear that brightness, brightness descending to dullness, brightness descending to dullness. So we've successfully pulled a few things away there and we're really nibbling at the edges, kind of scared to jump into the, the big pit in the middle. But, you know, this is all useful stuff. We're getting a little bit of clarity of the of the core sound for when we for when we actually attack it. That's pretty much it for the easy stuff. There's not much more that we can easily strip away. The gravity module is actually um, central to the generation of the sound. It's what's doing the, the, the heavy lifting here because we've got an uh, impact gate set to horizon, which means every time the projectile hits the outer surface of the universe, the rectangle at the edge of the universe, that's what the horizon is, it's generating a keyboard trigger. And that keyboard trigger is what's sustaining the sound. So if I turn the gravity module off, it winds down like a spring. It's lovely, really. And if I turn it back on, it'll crank itself back up again. Now, the reason you're hearing that gradual tail away and ramp uh, when I turn the, fu the, the, the function back on is because of the shape of the envelope generator. So if we, if we accept that this is basically just generating keyboard triggers, it's doing other stuff, but for now, let's just concentrate on the keyboard trigger aspect of it. Let's see where those keyboard triggers are going. Well, they're not going to the envelope generator. The envelope generator is firing off the sequencer. So that's an, a non-starter. We're not seeing this envelope directly off us striking the key. What's actually happening is that the keyboard is generating two different triggers. It's going to the pulser, but I want to ignore that for now. Let's just forget the pulser for the time being. I want to concentrate on the sequencer. The keyboard is firing the sequencer. See, every single time that projectile hits the horizon, the outer rectangle, it's, it's stepping on. And you can see that there's variance in the speed at which the sequencer steps on because it's essentially random. That sequencer trigger, those instantaneous firings are 
hitting the envelope generator because we're set to trigger select sequence. And the envelope generator with no sustain is going through a very slow attack phase and then a very slow decay phase. So it's basically drawing one triangle every time it's fired, every time the envelope is fired. And so what we're getting when we turn this gravity module on, just let it kind of wind down, is the first time the projectile hit the wall, so the, the northern wall back here, that generated a trigger to the sequencer. The sequencer fired the envelope. The envelope opens the low pass gate. And so we start to hear sound. Now we've got loads of other sound effects going on as well. But that's the important thing to bear in mind. Sequencer triggering the envelope generator. Envelope generator is, is, is going to do its thing. Remember when we talked about it, the moment you ask the envelope generator to do a job, it's going to do the whole of that job. It's going to draw the whole of the attack phase and the whole of the K phase and won't listen to anything else until it's finished with its work. It's very single-minded. So it does that and we hear that slow ramp. That then translates into the amplitude um, modulation at the, the control voltage, the gate control voltage input, and we hear the sound. So let's have a look a little bit deeper as to what else the envelope generator is doing, because it's not just opening the low pass gate. You can see that there are two other connections um, uh, that it uses as well. The first one is going into the complex oscillator's pitch control voltage, and it's quite a hefty chunk as well. So this envelope, whatever the envelope's drawing, the big, the big attack and the, the long decay or release, that's having an effect on the complex oscillator's pitch. See the pitch slider is set all the way down. I take this out again and bring it up to something that's reasonably static. We're no longer having that envelope-based modulation of the pitch. But you can hear there's a lot of there's a lot of pitch modulation still going on in there. So this is what I was talking about with it being really difficult to start from the ground up because the all of these effects, all of these modules are actually having a sum total effect and they're all vying for the same space. In this case, we're talking about many different sources of frequency modulation, pitch modulation, and that becomes like really, really difficult to parse. So we have to carefully strip them away one at a time and then we can notice it by its absence. Other than that, everything else in the complex oscillator is absolutely straightforward. There's, there's really nothing complex going on at all. I'm avoiding talking about this blue cable at the moment. We'll come back to that later. Okay, so let's find the other sources of pitch modulation. Well, one of them is in the gravity module, and we can take that out of the equation, e equation pretty easily. The complex oscillator's pitch is being modulated by the X destination. And we saw uh, in, in a previous video that very small numbers on this dial, just past 12 o'clock, have a dramatic effect on the sound. So let's bring it back up. Now I'm going to set this to 50% by double clicking it. Hear how dramatic that difference was. That tiny, tiny amount on the dial. So we've got rid of yet another one of the pitch modulations. And it's coming from the modulation oscillator itself. Because it's set to FM mode which means that the modulation oscillator is acting as a frequency modulator on the complex oscillator behind the scenes with the internal um, semi-modular wiring. So you can see we're in low frequency mode here and the frequency dial is actually turned all the way down, but the envelope is having a maximal control voltage impact on the frequency modulator. And so this is our next box that we can tick when we're looking for all of the different frequency modulations that are being applied to this thing. Let's bring the volume back up. And we'll take this cable out. Still a lot going on. It's, it's, it's a multi-layered onion, this one. Plug it back in. So you can hear that when the envelope's plugged in, the modulation oscillator is 
much, much faster beyond our ability to identify any individual pulses because the control voltage is set so high. So it's increasing this to the point where it's no longer an identifiable LFO. It's uh, like a, a tonal effect at that point. It's worth mentioning just briefly that we're in square wave mode here. So we're going to be hearing harsh leaps in the pitch. This isn't a smooth kind of triangle thing. Let's keep going. We're not done with our frequency modulation effects yet. This is where the pulsar comes into the equation. So you can see the pulsar is absolutely rattling away. It's triggering as quickly as the sequencer does. They're both taking keyboard instructions off the gravity module. This projectile is absolutely leathering the horizon. And so we see all of these triggers at the pulsar gate. The pulsar has a very fast period, so it's decaying very quickly. And we get this tiny little kind of transient light. That control voltage is then being fed into the modulation oscillators modulation slider. This is the thing that controls how much FM gets fed into the complex oscillator. This here, this modulation slider, is what controls our ultimately our level of frequency modulation into the oscillator. And this is a control voltage input. So every time this pulsar fires, it's basically very quickly sending a big control voltage change to the modulation oscillator, which is changing the, the FM, and then it's decaying again very, very quickly. So we only hear it as a flutter. It's really hard to catch this. But we're going to set out to this. We're concentrating on frequency modulation here, so I'm not going to divert. But at some point very soon, I'm going to have to bring in yet another effect that's once again having an impact. We just can't hear all of these things at the same time. So I'm having to kind of choose which order um, to, to present them to you. So we're going to start trying to identify what the pulse is doing. That's our, that's our goal. I'm going to get this going quite quietly in the background because it's deeply irritating. First thing that I'm going to do is take the envelope out of the equation. So that's just a variable we just don't need. So now we can hear that the, the LFO is static. The speed at which the LFO is operating is now static. You can hear the square wave turning on and off in the background. But can you hear that really distracting tonal colour that's being applied to it as well. That's actually coming, I'm going to turn it off completely just for a moment, that's coming from this up here, the complex oscillator's waveform modulation in the gravity module. This is the first time I think that we've had an opportunity to really hone in on what this is doing. The complex oscillator waveform um, value is the toggle switch and what this control is basically doing is it's flipping the wave type of the complex oscillator and it's it's like the top third of the screen the toggle switches all the way up in the middle third we're on the square wave and then at the bottom of the screen we're in triangle mode and that dramatic switching of the waveforms is superimposing itself on the the square wave kind of frequency modulation thing that the modulation oscillator is doing. So what I'm going to do is turn it back up and then turn this off. You hear that? So it's stripped another way, another one of the, the kind of polluting influences on the sound away. So if we've got a static value, finally we've managed to get rid of all of those kind of additional polluting influences and we hear the pure, I'll let this go for a moment, we hear the pure sine uh, wave basically on, off, up, down, applying frequency modulation to the complex oscillator. If I sped this up, And then I'll bring the uh, envelope generator back in. 
that's how fast you know that the envelope generator is cranking this all the way up control voltage see if you look at the light the orange light of the envelope generator you can see that it's basically on all the time because it's receiving so many instructions that the, the gate is essentially fully open if we stopped the gravity module then the envelope dies away and you hear the whole sound just die all of the frequencies kind of cascade and the volume fades away and that's how it's able to just fade away in that kind of glorious way so here we are with our pulsar disconnected just hearing that really simple up and down and i introduced some arbitrary amount of frequency um, increase into the into the FM in order that we can hear that toggling but then the pulsar comes along and fires these big control voltage pulses in so we're getting all of these dramatic increases in, in FM or in, in the amount of modulation that's being applied Now, very often when I'm doing these things, I've, I've moved so many sliders and moved so far away from the original preset sound, I'm actually just going to get us back there. And then throw some of this stuff back away again. There's the little pitch variation disappearing. Here's the waveform switch disappearing. I'm going to leave it there. Now let's have a look at what the modulation wheel's doing. So at the moment, the modulation wheel's all the way down. I'll start turning it up. It's all the way up now. I'll play some notes on the keyboard. Now, wheel all the way down. The difference between those two sounds, I realise I have to play lots of keys for you to hear it. The difference between those two sounds is the additional control voltage that's being supplied by the modulation wheel to the pulsar, which in turn is applying more frequency modulation to the complex oscillator, and we hear it as a different tone, colouring, a different colouring of tone. Okay, I hope you're hanging in there. I know there's an awful lot to process. This is a really complex preset, but it's a fabulous way to learn the tool. This is how I learn these instruments. Let's have a look at this blue cable that I said to ignore. What's that doing? Well, the simple answer is absolutely nothing. The sequencer uh, has all of its voltage levels set to zero, which means it doesn't matter what stage of the sequencer we're at. The, the triggers are really important, they're firing the envelope generator, but in terms of these control voltage gates, there's no signal coming out of them, it's just a flat zero. And these outputs, these control voltage outputs, take their feed from whatever signals the sequence is sending out down here. So the, the, the voltage going in here is always zero. It's not doing anything. But when I see stuff like this, particularly from the, the Archuria guys, you see quite a few of these Easter eggs. It's just something lying around. And rather than thinking that cable's pointless, I'll throw it away. I like to think, well, what if, why is that there? What would it do? What would happen if I started increasing these voltage, these voltage levels? The answer is that you'd start getting different amounts of control voltage flowing out of these gates through this pipe into this control voltage input. And we would have a modulation effect on the timbre of the complex oscillator, which meant every time we step on, every time this sequencer steps on, we're going to get a different tone out of the complex oscillator. So up at the top, it's at its brightest. The control voltage is at its maximum. And down at the bottom, we're applying no control voltage change at all. Now 
in this configuration, the sequencer is a sample and hold device. It's taking a, a noise-based, a random signal. I'm, I'm saying noise-based because it's essentially random when the projectile is going to hit this horizon. That value, that, that trigger, is moving the sequencer on one step. When it moves on, it picks a new control voltage. Now, granted, there are five and they're, off and they're fixed. With a true sample and hold generator, you, you're very often working with completely random noise levels, signals, and it will generate a control voltage at that level and hold until it receives a new signal. Well, that's what the sequence is doing. So we have a rudimentary sample and hold module here. And if we hadn't thought to turn these voltage sliders up, to see what was going on with this um, control over here, we wouldn't have been able to kind of make that connection and figure out what that module was doing. So I really like kind of doing those little bits of investigation. Why is that cable there? What's it doing? It's, it's giving you an opportunity to, to learn an awful lot about the instrument. One thing left to talk about, which is channel B. <laughs> We've only actually dealt with channel A, but channel B is, is actually really straightforward. You get in this. What you're hearing there is the low frequency oscillator. It's very unusual to have the low frequency oscillator directly acting as an audio source, but it's exactly what it is. It's a, 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 an identifiable tone that the tuner can pick up. Eventually you lose the tone, you lose the ability to identify an individual tone out of the sound. Not quite, it's actually still just about there. There is some identifiable tone, but that's what we're hearing out of channel B, just this kind of throbbing. So there is tone there. Maybe not right down at the bottom. So that's kind of cool, this like pulsing, Harley kind of throb going on in the background out of channel B. And finally, we've reached the end of the deconstruction. This is a, a, a really, Fascinating preset. I've, I've loved figuring out how this thing makes it sound and the definitely takeaways. I, I, I really enjoy the way that the gravity module interacts with the sequencer. But yeah, something that starts out sounding like some kind of random space effect, you know, something that was completely unusable in a musical context. You figure out that if you start stripping stuff away, you can actually acquire quite a, quite a, a significant level of control over it. And then it becomes a usable tool. Hope you've enjoyed the video. If you did, please consider subscribing, hit notifications. You'll be sure not to miss my other content. Hope to see you there. Thanks a lot.